Hi everyone, welcome to Tasting History. I'm your host, Max Miller, and today it is the second week of Lent, and I have given up absolutely nothing. But a lot of people have. A lot of people give up chocolate for Lent, or alcohol, or eating the little pieces of popcorn that fall out when you're at the movies and you have to like pick it up off your shirt. Anyway, a lot of people give things up for Lent. And that is nothing new. In the Middle Ages, there was a whole host of things people gave up every single Lent. They couldn't eat meat, they couldn't eat dairy, they couldn't eat basically anything from an animal. So today we're going to explore some of the creative ways medieval chefs dealt with this doctrinal dilemma, and we are going to create our own sweet rice porridge with dates and almonds called a Brouette of Almain in Lent, today on Tasting History. Now, porridge was very common in the Middle Ages, not just for the poor, but for the wealthy. It was just kind of a catch-all meal, and it usually had milk in it. But during Lent, milk was verboten. So, what did they use instead? Well, you might be surprised to find that many medieval chefs turned to that most favored drink of yoga moms and vegans world over, almond milk. What? Almond milk in the Middle Ages? Yes, almond milk in the Middle Ages. Just like today, it was an excellent substitute for animal milk. And according to medieval physician Andrew Board, it doth comfort the breast, it doth mollify the belly, and provoketh urine. I'm pretty sure the almond milk industry just found its new slogan. It even came in different flavors. You could use water for the original flavor, wine for, you know, your savory meals, or in the 15th century recipe I'm using today, sweetened with honey. So let's get started. For this almond milk, you'll need a half cup of pulverized almonds. Now you can either pulverize your own, or just buy almond flour, it basically does the same thing. One and a half teaspoons of honey, a dash of salt, and one cup of boiling water. Take your honey and your salt, and pour the boiling water over it, and mix to dissolve. Then pour the liquid over the pulverized almonds, and allow to soak for about 10 minutes. Give it a stir occasionally with one hand, and with the other hand, go ahead and smash the like button. Then hit that subscribe button, tap the notification bell so you can always stay up to date with tasting history. Once your 10 minutes is up, strain it through a sieve into a bowl. Now while almonds were a great substitute for milk, they didn't do much to address the main issue during Lent. You don't get to eat no meat. Now of course people ate a lot of fish on fasting days, that's what Lent is kind of known for, but back in the Middle Ages it wasn't just Lent, it was also every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday of the year. It's gonna get a little old. And if you didn't live near an ocean, then you ended up mostly eating salted cod and herring. Mmm. And in the words of one poor 15th century schoolboy, Thou will not believe how weary I am of fish, and how much I desire that flesh will come in again. For I have eaten none other than salt fish this Lent, and it has engendered so much phlegm within me that it stops my pipes that I can scarcely speak nor breathe. So whatever was this poor lad to do? Well, let me answer that question with a riddle. When is a puffin not a puffin? Answer? When it's a fish. Oh! That's right. In the Middle Ages, they would do pretty much anything to classify something as a fish. Basically, if it had anything to do with water, it was a fish. Take the porpoise. Clearly a mammal, and they knew that back then. But because it swam, they classified it and dolphins as fish, so they could eat them. I mean, they swam, so I get it. They were acceptable for the porpoise of eating. But how about beavers? I imagine one monk said to another, how are we going to classify beavers as a fish? Well, said monk too, they do have fins, kind of, that paddle in the back, and it's scaly like a fish, so there you go. Beaver, fish, same thing. Okay, but what about puffins? I mean, that's a bird, you can't, that puffin. Yes, but a puffin lives on an island which is in the ocean and they often go into the ocean to feed on fish, so puffin, fish, same thing. So as you can see, they were starting to stretch the definition of fish pretty thin. You could even say that the definition was fluid. That was the worst one yet. But the weirdest medieval fish had to be the barnacle goose. Uh. See, before they understood bird migration patterns, barnacle geese were never seen to be nesting in temperate Europe. 
they would just kind of appear one day, usually sitting out on, you know, floating logs and other driftwood. There would also be barnacles attached to this driftwood. And so people put it together that these geese don't come from eggs, they hatched from those barnacles. So they're geese of the ocean. So they're fish, right? Anyway, they were good to eat for Lent. Now maybe you knew that almond milk wasn't just a modern ingredient, but what about mock meats? Surely things like tofurkey and the Impossible Burger, that stuff is modern, right? Nobody's going to make mock meats in the Middle Ages. Oh, <laughs> but they do, laddie. They do. Medieval cooks loved to find ways to take Lent-approved foods and turn them into non-Lent-approved foods, like bacon. They would take strips of pink salmon and mold white pike roe along the edges to make it look like bacon. Why? I have no idea. But that was nothing in comparison with the unholy abomination that is the mock egg. A 1430 recipe instructs the chef to take empty eggshells and fill it with an almond milk gelatin. Then take ground almonds and create a circle in the center and dye it yellow with saffron and ginger. So gross. But very popular in the 15th century. How our palates have changed. So medieval people were willing to give up a lot of ingredients during Lent. But there was one ingredient that was just a bridge too far. And you butter believe it, it was butter. Yes, before the days of I can't believe it's not butter, Europe was enamored with the yellow spread, especially in France. By the 15th century, breaking your fast with butter in France was so common that the enterprising French church decided to create an indulgence that would allow people to eat butter during Lent without burning in hell. The city of Rouen collected so much money from the butter indulgence that they were able to build a new tower under their cathedral and dub the tower the Butter Tower. Delicious. And speaking of delicious, let's get back to our porridge. Now that we have our almond milk ready to go, we can create our brouette of Almain in Lent. All you'll need is one cup of the almond milk, one tablespoon of rice flour, two tablespoons of sugar, and three dates, two chopped and one minced. Now I've listed all of the ingredients for this and the almond milk in the description down below, along with links to some of the more uncommon ingredients. There are also the original medieval recipes if you'd like to read them, as well as the modern interpretations that I'm using today. So first, take a saucepan and add your almond milk, the rice flour, the sugar, and the finely minced date. Then whisk it all together and heat on medium until it comes to a boil. Then turn it down to low and simmer for about 15 to 20 minutes or until the porridge gets nice and thick. Every minute or so, make sure to give it a good stir with the whisk so nothing burns on the bottom. Once it's done, remove it from the heat and strain it into a bowl. Then go ahead and dish it up. This is either two small portions, maybe for dessert, or one larger portion. Then garnish it with the chopped dates, and maybe toss a little more sugar on there if you want. Then go ahead and serve it forth. And so here we are, brouette of Almain in Lent. Let's give it a shot. Get some of those dates. That is delicious. Make this. Go make this. It's not that hard and it is delicious. Wow. It's like a warm hug. Now if you end up making your own brouette of Almain in Lent, make sure to leave me a comment below and let me know if yours is delicious as mine is because this is amazing. And even if you don't make it, make sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and join me next time on Tasting History. This would be a really good breakfast. Or anything. Lunch, dinner, dessert. Awesome. Really awesome. Hmm.